Welcome to Brazil Forum UK 2020. My name is Mariana Filizola and I'm a master's degree in education and uh, digital media from University College London and I'm going to be with you today in this panel Science in Crisis and this is thanks to the voluntary work and time of our um, organizing committee and also the support of our sponsors Fundação Haddad, Fundação Lehmann, Media Big Data and the legal office PGMBM. Also, to our broadcasting partner, Stadon, that gives us the chance to be able to broadcast the events throughout the world live and free of charge. Overcoming a global crisis never depended so much as on scientific knowledge. In Brazil, this is happening against a very alarming scenario. The country is uh, confronting a crisis in how it uh, assesses science this is without precedent also lack of resources failure to believe in academic discourse and also a wide gap between society and the scientific community this is why we have invited a team that will bring to the table some very essential um, topics for discussion and we have Elena who is a biomedical science and also president of the inter-american network of science academies the sound is gone completely no sound No sound at all. So there's been a crisis in Brazil in education. Right, this is impossible. We can't do it with a word every few seconds, I'm afraid. No sound from Marcelo Nobel. No, here? 
If you consider the situation we're going through, it's important that, no, it's gone again. So we're in a situation that is absolutely without precedent. We're in 2020 and still often we have to really assert the fact that the land, that the earth is round and that um, knowledge and understanding is essential. But there's also a great deal of disbelief in science itself. And we're living through a period when there's a lot of attack to the state universities. Um, in the state universities, uh, um, we used to have problems in the, in the past, but this is a situation in which this phenomenon was before an intellectual pro before education. This was in the Middle Ages, but now suddenly we have this um, phenomenon happening in the middle of a pandemic in Brazil. It's paradoxical, if you like. We are returning, if you like, to science now as something important in the universities. Of course, they're fundamental for the development of the country and society is beginning slowly to understand that universities, research institutes are very important for survival of humanity. And so what do we have to do in terms of education and uh, in the situation we're in? We need to, like never before, make the most of this moment. We have to consolidate, we have to leverage this um, science use this media that we have to make it available and to uh, broadcast and tell society and to really make it known that without universities, without research institutes, without good science, no country, no society at all can survive. And I think this is the principal message that we should be transmitting right now. It's so fundamental for the times we're living in. Thank you, Marcelo. Thank you. That's important for starting our conversation. Now, could I ask Elena this question of how we were going through this crisis and just a bit before the, the pandemic. Brazil, again, already at that time, was not really giving science its due position and attention. Thank you, Mariana. I'd like to thank you very much, you young people from Brazil Forum in UK 2020, because there have been five consecutive events, and including this one, in the midst of a pandemic. And this, for me, and I'm older, this shows that we have got a solution. So we've got young people they don't think, but many do believe and do fight towards building something. So this crisis is in fact one that has been approaching for some time. And I think as scientists and teachers, we have to say mea culpa because the ruler who was trained in a university, who worked in paleontology, and has done so much and has published things, Pirula. He communicates. But unfortunately, it's not just a question of communication. And we're paying the price of this. If we add all this up, a whole succession of events, the Failure to believe in science has been creeping up systematically in such a way that it's a major hope when Gilma was president that science will be without frontiers. But finally, we are now going to attach value to science because of it is a country has got to have science and the money that was new wasn't so new and we have been going through crises and cuts 
and society i i think looking over the past two years almost two years science is being viewed as a cost as very as a cost as an expense and i'm concerned about this if we discuss um, science in crisis, Brazil in crisis, this is very worrying. I am in favor of a quality university. It can be private. I've got nothing against private initiative, but private initiative has to be quality. As you can see in PUC University, the Catholic University, the Sinus University in Rio Grande, there are all sorts and there are others that um it's 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 a teaching almost in the stock market of universities so this society has been invaded by information that is crazy globo news and so on when you hear this stuff when there's an interview with saji or uh, Minister Marco Spontes, who says, wait, I've been there, I've seen things. And so it's becoming a tragic comic, comedy. Elena, could you move slightly to the side so that we can see you and perhaps it will help the interpreting. Thank you. So what is happening? Another thing. Has, has stirred all this up, has he? No. Everyone can think that they're, they're a god, but science, researching and looking for data so that a hypothesis or a theory it may be wrong, but uh, there's no absolute truth. And this and now, now, obviously, uh, again, in, you can see that we've got public universities, state universities, not getting the value attached than they should. Those that are commanding who are to the front in all states, the doctors, the nurses, all of them in that area, the philosophers, were all trained, the majority were trained in state universities. Those, again, uh, who are looking to vaccine are now shouting for vaccine. But again, it's a change in perspective. And I fully agree with Marcelo. We, we, we need to keep the flame alive because with a pandemic it may last but it will it will go it will go eventually and in the major media in brazil and the press has always spoken about science education but television the papers radio are looking for opinions from scientists and we have to understand where we're going or, or what kind of curve are we talking about to to bring the curve down i sincerely hope that people will come out stronger from this crisis if we learn our lessons if each one goes back home to do what they used to do, then no. Okay, that's that's my opinion. Thank you very much, Helena. And Marcelo mentioned this as well. When this crisis is showing how important it is to attach value to science, and people are looking at things differently, 
I know that you were working in science for years. Did you feel that people on the whole don't understand what science is all about? Pirolo. Well, I only heard the last word. What was it? What was the last word? It's difficult. The sound's not too good. Got it? Yeah. Well, the fact is, we also joke that, uh, that science was the, the first victim of fake news in March. Religious uh, reasons and other reasons as well. For example, this question of uh, vaccines and climate change, all of it came in and a whole series of other um, sciences. But in this fight against fake news, it's a bit more than just the media or politics and other little pockets of society where things are getting worse. But the ideas, atypical, which before were in certain places, we knew that there were always uh, these groups, uh, those that um, denied the existence of science, but uh, they, they, they didn't take things that far and the media wasn't particularly concerned about them. And, their little world was didn't go far beyond their own circle. But of course, it could be bad for everyone because it's a question of, of freedom here. These people speak nonsense and they at the same time gain voice, they get their, they're listened to. And some recent research has said that the best way to combat this is to get a vaccine. And then they won't let you hear about vaccine because they think it's it's bad. A lot of the laymen, the, the population that don't understand science, it's as if you discovered some suspicion of thing that so there's no confidence coming back. It's something that's very frightening. And people get paranoid about this. They're afraid. So contact with science often means that people start questioning things. They don't have any uh, motive for looking to something new that's coming out of science that's going to help them. With the coronavirus, it has left people in despair because uh, this question of science and how it works without any idea of how they're going to get out of this, what miraculous cures might come along. There are always those who turn to that. Somebody's found a, 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 rem a remedy for the world. They found a vaccine or something, or the virus is a genetic manipulation and somebody has uh, manipulated this. Even those peoples that, that, that follow serious science, you also find people are not entirely sure what science does. So at the same time as the coronavirus has attacked, and when you need science, and as Marcelo said, when the state university is absolutely fundamental, it is, it, it is not a, a, a place of uh, wizards and witches. Um, the university uh, is, is a good place. I, I, I've never heard um, such stories. So, so anyone who invents these things is either because the, they haven't been to a university, they don't like the university or whatever. So these things at the same time as the pandemic has raised the, the, the image of science, even in the social networks, or an app comes which is automatic and gives you a, a cheaper telephone calls, etc., and you can pass these ideas around very quickly and very cheaply. This also means that science can indeed be spread. Recently, if you defend science, then you're within the political sphere. 
if something doesn't work, then you're against the president. It's all got mixed up. And this ideological idea, thinking about the good things science is doing, but you know, going to cry in a corner is doctors. They were talking about how coronavirus is, 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 is spreading hospitals when staff are working day and night. They also can fall sick as well. Our colleagues fall sick. And they were saying that at the start, you everyone was applauding the health uh, staff. Uh, they were doing so much and everyone was thanking them. But today you've got people who are who are being extremely rude to them. They're saying that they scarcely exist. It's denying progress and evolution. They're now saying that it's a state of madness that is getting worse than what it was at the beginning. And this is even worse. I didn't think anything could get worse, but this is very serious because this has only happened because there's a um, brainwashing cam campaign to politicize science through these different campaigns for denying it and they're being very effective. So, although where this idea came from, we don't know. Uh, it's, it's another um, which came out of the cupboard and it's frightening. It really is, is quite shocking. So, when uh, science is being uh, denied or spat upon in some groups, it gets up to the president's uh, president of the, the country. Uh, so I don't know if USA is, is a, the same thing there. Again, there it's, it's, it's the same, but in Brazil, it's even worse than the USA because we have to consider those in the fifth year in school could never manage to follow science and now they end up being secretaries or ministers or whatever. It's a big, big mess. Thank you, Pirulo. I think you raised an important point in that discussion. This makes us think that this is nothing new because this is quite a traditional approach because sometime back you could read news that everything was eating eggs and eggs were good for you, but then some research had come out and they said, no, they're, they're bad for you. And then people felt a bit lost and here talking about educating people towards science because years before it was for example eggs and now it's the hydrochloroquine um, the sound is breaking up the sound is breaking up Bom, certamente esse é o grande desafio da divulgação da ciência. É uma discussão que é, ocorre. Aí... Well, certainly this is the biggest challenge when promoting science. This debate has been going on forever, and it has evolved as well. We went through a model known as the deficit model according to which we would imagine that people have an empty head that will be filled with information all the way to this moment where evolution shows people how science works in reality. So what's important of a placebo effect, a double-blinded research, having a randomized research and a series of order points. Science, just as order activities, is made by human beings. And we also have biases. We have vanity playing a part. Now, human beings, there are all sorts of situations that we also find in other environments. So it is not perfect. It doesn't have a solution. It's not a silver bullet for everything. So perhaps the solution 
that is shared by many people and I believe we only got to this stage of evolution because of science, so that perhaps it is the best way of understanding our world. But again, it does not hold all the answers, it's not all knowing, and it cannot, in a very fast way, achieve things, because we, de we are desperate, right? So at this moment, this is a fertile soil for pseudosciences, for weird beliefs because you have an ill person in your family and you are desperate for a cure i assure you you will believe anything so nowadays that is multiplied potentialized that's our current situation during the pandemic so indeed this is a um, very fertile ground for uh, pseudoscience, right? So our biggest challenge is how to show an effective way that science promotion and how science works. And as Barula said, there is an important information. We do have social network. If they hinder us on the one hand, then on the other hand, they also, you know, we have YouTube channels, podcasts. So we have a series of tools we didn't have before. We just had newspapers, books, and, you know, this is a peculiar situation. I believe it is important to remind ourselves that I'm quite the pessimist, usually, but in this regard, I'm a bit more positive. Those that do not believe in this disease, that believe that, um, you know, it's all fake, reality will prove them wrong. We have a reality that is much stronger than any kind of belief. Thank you, Marcelo. Helena? As Marcelo said, we do have a real vanity within the academia. At the same time, a big part of the Brazilian population is not educated in the scientific method. So Marcelo has already pointed out some of these issues. And I would like to know for you as a researcher, how much of this crisis is due to the gap between the scholars and the people and what is the solution i'll just scoot over so you don't tell me off i, I believe I, i'm fitting the screen now okay so I do not believe that the scientists are to blame the professors, the researchers. I don't think they are to blame for the lack of dialogue. What I see in reality is that all of us who belong to universities, and education institutions, we have yet to learn how to communicate. We have many positive examples. So I don't know if I always try to see the silver lining, the bright side of things, because otherwise I would have given up, right? At my age, you know, I'm still fighting for resources and for the students. And that's because I believe we can still help. So that's why we keep fighting. I'll give you a few examples. There was a group involving the media, okay, that has destroyed the Royal Institute people. And we asked for them to be punished, but they were not. was a group of uh, pseudo activists and they wasted public resources they broke all the equipment crucial fundamental research about medicines that were being developed fully in brazil media 
talked about the puppies. So media was confused regarding what side to take. We must remember that we have a law built by scientists. Let's think about what happened now. The government was refuting the fires in the Amazonia rainforest, but science proved it. It showed it to people. So at times, I believe that we talk in a more hermetic, a more closed, enclosed way. Perhaps we should be more straightforward. And nowadays, the politicization of education and science, or even before that, I'd say that education and science are all part of culture. And the Brazilian people are throwing all of that in the bin. So we have racism coming back. Our education minister already being laid off has signed an ordinance cancelling affirmative actions for black and indigenous students. All of that is resurfacing. Is that what the Brazilian people is all about? Is the Brazilian people indeed racist? Are we bellicists? Are we anti-science? For real? Or are we going to let a handful of people speak for everyone? That's why I tend to see the hassle glass and see the positive side of things. We have a series of evidences. We will not accept impositions. We didn't accept that during the military dictatorship. When we were students, we fought against it. And we gave the vast majority of uh, the population a democracy, a quite young democracy. That's true, but a democracy nonetheless. So I would say that if someone is to blame is all of us, the Brazilian people in general. And then I want to understand who is the Brazilian people? Are we chauvinists? Are we racists? That's what we have to ask ourselves, who we are. We were, was it so deep embedded, so ingrained in ourselves that we needed COVID-19 to make all of these things surface? Because I do not believe that that represents the Brazilian people. I think it is a minority. And yes, social media, they came for the, for the best, I believe, but they can use however one wishes, right? And I believe that fake news is beating up science and education because here in Sao Paulo, Mariana, all the public policies, you know, they were under scrutiny. They were audited. So you see, in my opinion, this is, it is in vogue now. It is a fashion to say that fashionable to say that everything is uh, corrupted. Okay. And some of, sometimes those that affirm that they are involved in corruption themselves. Not all of them, but sometimes. Oh. As I said before, we should say mea culpa for not knowing how to communicate better, but we are still fighting and we will turn the tables. I do not accept this Brazilian people that goes and screams at nurses and physicians who are saving lives. And tomorrow it could be their brother in the hospital being saved or their father, we don't know. That has happened elsewhere, not only in Brazil. There is an um, authoritative model being copied here from Hungary, of the country itself, but of the current 
political model that they have. We are copying the Trump administration, series of uh, governments that um, love denialism but do not propose anything. I would like to see Mr. Olavo de Carvalho coming here this evening to talk to us, but to dialogue with data, not with assertions. I am available to talk at any time. I respect and I want to be respected. Thank you, Elena. Pirula. Now, Elena mentioned important points to be discussed. And when we talk about scientific promotion, as Marcelo said, you are the person that has a vast experience, right? To share with everyone. So I would like to say amongst your years working as a scientific promoter, do you feel any difficulty in doing that? I don't know if you've heard about the Carl Sagan event. He was a great science promoter in the 80s, but he had his tenure at Harvard University denied. So how do you see this role of promoting science? Has it changed since then? Well, Mariana, for me, the problem with the scientific promotion is how much people lack in terms of understanding certain subjects. So you must understand, you need to be aware of what pe people do not understand. So you can explain to them. We have very delicate subjects because they involve the emotions, for example, animal testing, as Elena mentioned. So all of that can become quite a controversy, right? Medicine development. Some people believe that, uh, you know, there is an industry and someone wants to hide the cure so that people die. We need to understand where is the deficit. In my experience with medicine and evolution, I remember that one of the biggest issues was to explain what was falsiability and what was a theory. Once I explained that, then people could understand evolution much better. I could talk for 80 hours about dinosaurs and the whales ancestry, but once I explained what was a theory, what was a scientific theory and why science comes from a solid place, that became much easier. I told that to some professors, look, I have a channel on YouTube, right? So I'm going to say, I'm going to make a video about theory, explaining what is a scientific theory. And then the professors would tell me, why, why are you going to make such a video? Do people do not know that? Do people not know what a theory is, but no. So I talked about climate change in one of my videos and I interviewed a series of professors that work with meteorology and, um, you know, people from um, the Sao Paulo University and etc. Many of such professors had excellent explanations about climate change, but I would always tell them Wait a minute, Professor, please. People are challenging something else. They are challenging, why doesn't it come from the sun? And then they would say, well, but it's obvious that it's not, the sun is not a problem. And I'd say, yes, I know it's obvious, but that's their argument. So we have to answer their questions, what they are challenging, right? Maybe that is the point, because internet is so fast. You can explain about vaccines for a decade. People are saying that you are being, that the vaccines are being tampered with, okay? And that you're going to have mercury inje in injected in your arm if you take a vaccine. So you need to go to that point. Wait, wait a minute, let's take a step back and understand what are people questioning. 
And the most serious part and now and during the pandemic, it becomes blatantly evident is that once you answer and you demystify one argument, these guys are going to go along and come up with another one. And that's the problem, you know, internet quotes. I'm mixing up different examples in my mind right now, but, you know, it's much harder. Pardon, it's much easier to hoodwink people than to prove to them that they have been hoodwinked. Okay, so if you have a shallow argument and it takes a long time to explain that something is false, this such shallow argument is harder to to fight. And Olavo is a master and he, he's, he's the master of doing that. Not because he has great knowledge, but just because he translates conspiratory theories that already exist in English, he just translated directly into, into Portuguese because he's not creative enough to, you know, just create things from his own mind. But if there is a talk between Helena and Olavo de Carvalho, I will enjoy it. I will have the time of my life watching it. So answering to your question, I think we need to understand the Achilles heel. What is the pain point? Do you see? More than trans it's more than transforming content in something attractive. It's understanding what people do not know, what they do not understand. Let's talk about a Bhutan Institute when um, it was put on fire, okay? There was a huge debate because people thought that uh, the poison extraction department was burned, but actually just the alcohol collection was banned and they were asking okay are they storing dead snakes and then we had to explain see this was important because we were saving materials that were collected at the polista avenue before it was cemented you know at the bahini neighborhood so we have important materials that were collected more than 100 years ago it takes a while for you to explain that people that were touched by the national archive burning to the ground well most of them were more concerned about the building itself then about the collection inside it, which was so valuable. I went to the museum, I shot a video there, and it's so sad, of course, but the building you can recover. The building will be recovered, but the collection, the museum collection won't be recovered. They are lost for good. I believe that's the point, you see, that's where scientific promotion should work. Why it is so sad, why it is really sad to lose the, the National Archive Museum. So the problem, in my view, is that with this wave of misinformation we, that we have today, and it is brainwashed, I agree with Lena, it's not that the majority of the Brazilian population is a fascist. It's just that they are such, they are so easy to, to seduce and to misguide, you know. We have, we that have some scientific knowledge, sometimes we fall in the traps. So, they, these people, they are um, easy praise, you see, and people took advantage of that to, to gain elections. So what I see is that now we have an even harder work to do. 
because we have to try and catch up so we are not left behind like alice's red queen we have to catch up yes and in that regard marcelo could you please tell us how the university may help to close this gap that Perula was talking about as an institution that promotes education and science. Because people continue to study, right? They're still going to the universities and social media will keep progressing as well. So in which way can the university close the gap? Well, truth is that here in Brazil, we have many, many issues. So I don't think we have enough time for me to talk about all of them. See, today we have in Brazil less than 20 percent, 18, well, for sure, less than 8, 20 percent of our young population in, in university, young people, 18, 19 years old. So let's talk about 8 million people that are in the university and a small part of them are in the state universities. So we have very few people going to the university comparing to 34%, 40% in the world average. We also have a problem of quality, stiffness in our syllabus, we do not, um, we are not as flexible as other universities around the world. So thinking about this, the big picture, the macro picture, we have many, many obstacles that we have to overcome. But what we have nowadays is a set of approximately 200 universities only 200 universities, and we have thousands of colleges of um, technical education centers. And what can we do? The vast majority of these universities, they are research universities, right? Where you are educating leadership and researchers for the next generation to keep the framework of research in our country, right? What has happened with this pandemic? Well, I will try, okay, to see the silver lining. Pandemic, we could glimpse at a movement from the society. So the perception has changed. The footprint of the university in the media has changed. Talking about my university, the Campinas University, we overnight created a volunteering program and we could reach, it was an outreach program and the society really responded to it in a positive way. So we should, we can seek not only a dialogue as we are doing this evening, but also we should seek to engage the community in a more effective way in our researchers, in our day-to-day -day work, in our development in general. So that is a positive side and a fundamental side, right? Just as people need to understand how science is made, they also need to understand how universities work, how the research institutions work. And naturally, with that understanding, we will recruit more allies amongst politicians and millionaires, billionaires, amongst the civil society, people from civil society that will help us I mean, from all places. And, um, my university, for example, someone mentioned the different fires, right? So that's quite a dilemma. We lack resources and we know that we need to deploy fire alarms and protection systems. Needs help, needs to get mobilized because it's fundamental. 
And this is a legacy that is so fundamental we must leave behind. Without good universities in a country, then Brazil will have no future. Marcelo, thank you, but keep calm and don't worry about time, even in the midst of pandemic, you can speak openly and uh, speak on. I'd like to pick up on the optimism that Marcelo spoke about, move back to something positive. And Elena, got a number of projects, a number of initiatives, and I wondered if you could share some of this with us. Give us a good example of what we have in Brazil. That is what the approaches we can use, so many different uh, ways of perhaps uh, processes for, for improving. But could you give us some ideas as to how we get out of what's happening? Thank you very much, uh, Mariana, for that. I'd like to agree fully with what Marcelo has said. Marcelo, it is impressive to see the solidarity of society. And it is this society, the Brazilian society, not some other. Once again, you out of position. <laughs> Yeah, I need to get comfortable in my chair. <laughs> I think Brazilian society, true Brazilian society, not some other that uh, we had before. And really our society, and this is why the optimism, because what I see, if we look to the past, there's a lot that was successful, but today, what do I see now? The impossibility of a success. Commitment on the part of young people. Young people, despite the crisis, and yes, we have got a crisis. Young men and women, girls and boys, looking to this investment in post-graduation. Nobody can live alone because that is a dream. They continue dedicated to their post-graduation. -gradu this is important. They're anxious. And I understand that I'm anxious as well because where are they gonna go after post-graduation? We have to start thinking, and no doubt that we have to, that post-graduation, one of something of great pride for me was the success of Brazilian science. And I've no doubt about that. What I see now is young people committed. And now, where are they going to go forward to without resources? What we are trying to achieve in Parliament, and uh, we are getting people to listen, everything that we're asking for, during the military dictatorship, what was created was a national Scientific and Technological Development Fund. That was created and it was funded, funding for science and technology. And this fund comes up with emergency funds, for example, this year. The government has already take 4.6 billion and left for industry 600 million. The dialogue that we're having with Parliament and with the National Congress, if they create a bill that would 
take this and turn it into a fund that would generate resources and that can never be blocked. This is a fund for everyone to understand that comes from the tax that the industrialists and the companies in Brazil are paying to reinvert it and reinvest it in the country. Now, this really stimulates me because I think if we had a possibility there, and there are other funds that are similar. On the other hand, there are things that leave me apprehensive and we're going to have to overcome them. After the pandemic, and Marcelo was the rector of Unicamp, working and he's done some incredible work. He, I'm envious of you, but in the right sense, Marcelo, it is an envy, it is a pride that I take in seeing what you have achieved because a number of federal states haven't managed to, or federal universities haven't managed to organize themselves in the way Unicamp did, from perhaps the actual nature of the university, but Unicamp got organized and looked to society, look at tablets and computers and managed to get the chips. And you had a project in Unicamp, indigenous peoples from the Amazon region, uh, and I saw them in a program, uh, which was a wonderful program. I wish Marcelo could speak a bit about this. One of the television programs, there was a, a young indigenous lad working there in Cachoeira, more or less, I think that was the city in the Amazon region. And he was saying, I am attending lessons. I'm doing my exercises because the university got me this and the chip that's in it. And we are going to have to see how we can continue with education in this time. Education, all of us. And I make an appeal here because uh, I'm, I'm getting on. And I mean, at my time, the, the the line was when you were a student you but now we have to build up what comes from education and Marcelo has already created a great deal how can we get things changed right from basic education up to a higher education how can we give the right signal within the right context. I can see a challenge for education, but at the same time, I'm optimistic. If during the pandemic, we've managed to send way up to São João de Cachoeira, I don't really remember the name of the town or the city. So Gabriel de Cachoeira, he managed to do these things in the midst of a pandemic then I think we can get there. And I'm from the uh, medical college. I was trained there. That was my Brazil. I did my post-graduation there. And all education uh, that I went to afterwards were always made from, from outside, not from France here, but I always came back to two positions here. Uh, when, I, when something was offered, I came back here. So Brazil, I am a Brazilian, but we're not capital. We have to give back to my institute so that we can help the future generation. And us, the older people, must continue in this struggle with all of you. And for some time, we can never lose faith or lose lose uh, our dynamism in this. It's uh, this business of fake news. We must fight against this. We must defend against it. 
you know, if somebody writes something and someone else comes along with something else. But I... Thank you, Elena. We're focusing now on positive things. How, how we look forward. Now, Pirula, you have a younger view, so how do you view it after what um, Elena has spoken of? Well, I don't consider I'm someone that does the best possible work, that I do it as, as, as well as I could. I make mistakes and uh, I've done a whole number of things that I shouldn't have done or would have done them differently if I'd had the chance to go back and do them again. I don't know if uh, I'm the best uh, example. I could certainly do better than I've done. Uh, I'm not maybe the best example, but one thing I can do well, and that is to inspire people to keep doing what they're doing, even if they get angry with me, because I tell them they could do better. But unfortunately, well, fortunately, I have inspired other people in science, because of course I always uh, thought well of science. And I think that um, people in the science blogs in Brazil, there's a whole network of blogs. These blogs existed before, obviously, but, but now uh, people are really using the blogs uh, because the visual uh, image is there. And, and the science blogs bring people together. Most of them are academics, many of them, and they have some contact with academia. Um, they're not necessarily scientists, but they are concerned, at least, with having a more reliable uh, material. And most of them began after me. They're people, they're younger than I am. And I think if I've managed to inspire that audience, then I think I've, I've done something positive. And that means Perhaps I'm not going to be the person that will make biggest differences, personally, that is, in the country. But if I manage to inspire someone who might be a future minister of science or a minister of whatever, uh, if I can inspire people for their future, perhaps in 10 years' time, then I'll have done something uh, worthwhile. And I really do believe in this audience that I reach and our voice will not always be heard uh, in the same way, but we can still get an audience together. We are focusing on, on, the, on the negative part of society because that's what shocks me most. But there are positive things because we get people together. We get them all together on the on on the blog or the or the YouTube. And this is used to be more difficult, but uh, you know it was difficult uh, with programs on television competing, etc. But now I think we can get people talking, and in the future, perhaps in the long term when people have been more vaccinated and they're on the internet, perhaps we can manage to educate people how to use the social networks. And this, again, if the world doesn't end before that, I think that that would be an achievement. Thank you. Right. Talking about inspiration, as you uh, just said, Lula, Last question for the three of you, a lot of people listening to us, and apart from speaking about the difficulties, this is also a space for inspiring young people. So I'd like to ask this last question. What is the dream of each of you for these young Brazilians? How do you foresee a way forward for them? The next generation? 
our dream for the next uh, future, next wave of you know, young Brazilians. Yes, that's it. You can begin. So, I, you want me to begin? Right. The situation, there's always two sides to everything. As Helena said, we are living through crisis after crisis. We should remember that one of the first major universities in Brazil arose in uh, 1984. And Unicamp, which today, of which I'm re rector at the moment, that was 66. So it's only about 50 years old. And it's among one of the best uh, universities in Latin America. And we achieved this in the midst of thousands of crises, not just one, there were political crises, financial crises, economic crises, there were crises of all kinds. And even then, and with bureaucracy, with problems, public sector, with all the obstacles that are thrown in your way, we managed as a country to set up a structure for science and technology, an infrastructure and a postgraduate structure and a structure of universities and research that is quite impressive if you consider uh, the side of all the difficulties we went through. Imagine if we had 50 years of peace and tranquility, democratic calm and resources, certainly, we would have had a different horizon ahead of us. Even then, we managed to create all that we have achieved. And today, now, when we look at uh, you organizing Brazil Forum and the young people here like Pirula and this whole movement, we can see. I am very, very pleased as a, a rector of a university to share all of this with you. I think uh, you are people who are very capable. So there are many fine people in this country who can actually change this country and to produce the finest quality science and education. And no doubt at all, our hope, as uh, Perula said, is to want not just one, but more several generations of people ahead of us who will be able to remove the inequalities and turn this country in a far better country to live in, and that we should be able to celebrate these uh, tremendous steps forward and remove the inequalities. This is my hope for the country, for the future. Of course, the daily routine, daily situation, I'm talking here because uh, I don't, I could be optimistic here, but I don't know that every day it's like this because we face whatever we do, but we're going to believe that it is possible. And I'd like to thank the invitation you've given me uh, to take part in this initiative. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcelo. Well, you have to be an optimist because you know alone you can't do it. You've got Perulo, you've got Elena. And now, Elena, what is your wish for the future generation? Well, this consumer desire seems to go through every crisis. I hope this will be the last crisis because we get more mature, you... But I do agree with everything Marcelo has said. And my dream is to see a fairer country, a country that certainly promotes education and that we haven't done before. We have to promote education. You've got to promote culture and promote science. These are things that are part of this promotion. And Brazil, if you look at the 90s, Brazil and China had the same GDP, but China today, and look at Brazil today, so 
what has happened to make them so different? This promotion of education and science. And China set up a system that is similar to that of Korea, because they all say, ah, look at, look at Brazil, look at Korea. Well, in Korea, the finest profession is on financially is that of teacher. That is, they want the best heads and minds to go and work with these young people, with children or adolescents. So what I would like to see is this promotion, recognition of quality in education. And when I look at the success, but I do remember Charlie Chaplin. Uh, remember him in the old days with his arms flapping? But it, it was at no point saying I want innovation. If there's no education without without there's going to be no innovation without education and we must generate this and go on generating technology and also entrepreneurship for the future and young people and since you in the midst of this pandemic have managed to over three weeks uh, as marcelo said it might be better in London or Oxford, but we're all together with our friends in London discussing these matters and young people involved in this. And they need to continue, not all of them, obviously, but there is hope for the future seeing what young people are doing. And I think this is an excellent opportunity. And I thank you for that with Marcelo. And I have greatest appreciation of his work, his wonderful work that he's done and that he's doing in Unicamp. And also, he, he's also president of the um, Association of Rectors in, uh, in, Sao Paulo, in the state of Sao Paulo. And again, with this crisis, an article appeared in Stadão today. It's a financial crisis as well because of the reduction of, of all that we need. But you have to build together. I look at Pirula. Last time I saw him, it's a long time ago. But it's lovely to see you in this whole team. And also all of you who are free and I give you a big, warm, virtual hug. Thank you very much. I'd like to... Well, first of all, I'd like to thank everyone for your invitation. For me, it's a great honor to be here with you, uh, together with people who are so distinguished and Of course, I would have rather be in London drinking a beer, a pint of beer. I don't even know if I'm worthy of being beside such important scholars, but I am very happy that we could chat virtually regarding what I expect my dream for the next Brazilian generation of scientists. Well, I have an utopia, like a, the biggest dream, the far-fetched dream, and I have a more grounded dream. So the far-fetched one is that in the future, what I do, scientific promotion, will no longer be necessary. Okay? So we wouldn't need it anymore because it would be so obvious. So my work would be unnecessary. Now, uh, a more realistic dream that I have is that we may 
understand how to value science, obviously, not to repeat a cliche or repeating what Helen and Marcelo already said, but obviously we have to, to value their scientific work and that we could have a less paranoid population. I receive messages all the time of people saying, um, look, through our arm starting my physics, chemistry, biology, undergraduation, and then I always say, please do not blame it on me. Once you have your BA, please do not blame it on me. But I would love for these people that are now starting to study science that they may be they may have the strength and the resilience to keep doing what they love because that's a privilege for very few people. And can in case the case of science, it must be free. The scientist must do their work with love and freedom. For that, of course, a financial situation is necessary. So my hopes for the future generation of scientists is that they don't have to waste their time fighting to exist simply so that they may better use their time working on science. Perula, thank you very much. Well, we are reaching the end of our talk and I would like to take advantage of all these optimism to invite you all um, in recognition of all the times we're leaving now and at the end of each panel, we are presenting a financing campaign related to the evening's topic. We believe that each one of us can do their part. So today we invite you to contribute with the project Alavanka Naiskola from the Pernambuco State Teachers Association. The goal of this project is to support and finance initiatives by teachers in public schools, promoting and state schools, promoting the culture of continuous improvement in projects such as women in science and free robotics. If you can help, please, we have a QR code. And thank you all so much, our speakers of this evening. It was a great lecture. Thank you all that um, saw, that participated in uh, our event this evening. We also thank the volunteers, staff in our organizing committee, in especial Leonardo Sousa, Marcelo Freire, Marco Rodriguez, Leonardo Demiesi, and Luisa Santa Barbara, who participated in the preparation of the science panel. We also thank Studio 42 for the production across for the interpretation of this event in English. My differences for the sign language interpretation and it is Tadown TV for broadcasting. You can watch this debate on our website, brazilforum.org, and on our social networks. We'll come back next Wednesday at 24th, 5 p.m. Brazilian time, 9 p.m. UK time, panel on development. What development do we want? Ailton Krenak, the former BNPS, Katia Abreu, Senator for the Teens of State, and Valeria Porto, a Quilombola activist, mediation of Gabriela Salmeiro. Good for you, see.